Hey, good morning, friends. I'm so glad you decided to join me to get your day started with a biblical perspective. Today, we're just going to dive on into our series and talk about an interesting story. So let's get started. This morning, we will be hanging out in Genesis 38 and reviewing today's unflannel graph story of Judah and Tamar. I'm definitely going to try to keep this brief, but there is a lot of information and background in this story, so I'm going to do my best to get it to you guys in a manner that makes sense. Okay, so the gist here is Judah is a married man, and he has three sons named Ur, An, Anan, and Shelah. And starting in verse 8, it says, Now Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was evil in the sight of the Lord, so the Lord took his life. Okay, we're going to pause right here because Old Testament is full of stories with little tiny blippets like this where, oh, someone just died because they were evil. It's a really weird and unusual part of the story. So basically, obviously, he was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord took his life, and that's verbatim. So I'm assuming that this man, Ur, was so outwardly evil that it was evident to everyone that the only reason he died was because the Lord took his life, because he was that horrible. And think Tamar was marrying him. So just an interesting note that he was known to be a terrible enough person that God took his life. So just a note of that. Okay, continuing. Then Judah said to Oh, Anan, I'm going to call him Anan, have relations with your brother's wife and perform your duty as a brother-in-law to, to her and raise up a child for your brother. Now, Onan knew that the child would not be his. So when he had relations with his brother's wife, he wasted his seed on the ground so that he would not give a child to his brother. But what he did was displeasing in the sight of the Lord. So he took his life also. Okay, small passage, a lot to unpack there. So first, let's start with the marriage. We need to give some historical context of the situation. At this time, the Israelites were obviously living under the Old Testament law, okay? So that included the Liverite marriage law, which basically states, the duty of a man is to marry the widow of his deceased brother when she has no sons. This law is found in Deuteronomy 25. So that's why Judah says, Perform your duties as a brother and brother-in-law and raise up a child for your brother. So basically, you have to, if your sister-in-law is widowed, she has no sons, no prospects, whatever, you're going to go ahead and do the duty of giving her an heir. And again, that's found in Deuteronomy 25. It says, if brothers are living together and one of them dies without a son, his widow must not marry outside the family. Her husband's brother shall take her and marry her and fulfill the duty of a brother-in-law to her. The first son she bears shall carry on the name of the dead brother so that the name will not be blotted out from Israel. Okay, this makes sense, right? But listening in this 2024 American mindset, it can sound a little controlling. However, this law is not only in place to keep the brother's name in Israel, but also to protect the woman. Being a widow was devastating in Old Testament times because your husband was the sole provider in the air. The women were literally at home squishing grapes with their feet to make wine, making bread without a KitchenAid, killing chickens and plucking them by hand and getting waters from wells, etc., etc., working their booties off basically domestically. Anyways, not to have a husband or a son meant that you were more than likely going to be destitute, poor, and possibly homeless. So this also gave me a different picture of marriage in the Old Testament because in our mind, you're supposed to find someone, fall in love and get married. But as a woman, once you married someone, if they obviously you wouldn't want something to happen to your husband. But if they have multiple brothers and something did happen to your husband, your husband knew that you'd be taken care of through the family. So as a woman, you're definitely protected and safe when you marry into a family with brothers. It's a lifelong taking care of situation by the family, not just the husband. So I thought that was interesting. Also remembering the historical society is important for this story. And I'm sure we'll cover others historical aspects in this series. But I first heard this explained by Dr. Kate McCoy in a podcast my mom actually sent me about women, women and period laws, which we'll probably cover in another episode because I think it's really interesting. But she explained the culture something like this. 
In this modern American society, we live in an individualistic culture. We're all about you do you. You want to go to college and move across the country? Go do that. You want to be a magician and follow the circus? Go for it. It's about being an individual. In the Old Testament, we are studying a collectivist society. In in collectivistic cultures, people are seen as fundamentally connected with each other in their communities. The entire family, the entire people, all the Israelites were working together towards the best interest of the group or the family, not just one person. So if your sister-in-law needed heirs to ensure she'd be taken care of and your brother's name would be passed down, you stepped up and did that because it helped the entire group, the entire family. It wasn't just about your specific wants or needs. Which, when reflecting back through the Old Testament, if you look at it with that lens, it kind of creates a different mindset for some of these stories. Another piece of culture that was at play here was it was a patriarchal society or world, I guess. All property was passed to the firstborn son. So if you didn't have one, it was a real crisis for you. Presumably, if a woman couldn't conceive, she could bear a son through a concubine, which would be kind of a secondary wife for her husband, which we see with Abraham and Sarah. This is the very issue also in the book of Ruth. Naomi's husband and two sons died, and she was trying to find a way back to her husband's land in Bethlehem. So a woman in this situation was in very serious trouble without a husband, especially if you're a widow with no children. The ideal situation was a large, multi-general family all living together. So as a woman, I guess you were really, or your parents were really looking for that for you to make sure you'd be taken care of for the rest of your life. Okay. So now that we have a little more understanding in the context of the situation, you do have to ask, what happens if a man says, "Mm, no thanks, my sister-in-law is not my type, I'm not going to do my duty, I don't really care about this. Okay, this is where it gets really interesting, and this is continuing in Deuteronomy. I literally laughed out loud when I read this, so, okay, it says, however, If a man does not want to marry his brother's wife, she shall go to the elders at the town gate and say, My husband's brother refuses to carry on his brother's name in Israel. He will not fulfill the duty of a brother-in-law to me. Then the elders of his town shall summon him and talk to him. If he persists in saying, I do not want to marry her, the brother's widow shall go up to him in the presence of the elders, take off one of his sandals, spit on his face and say, This is what is done to the man who will not build up my brother's family line. That man's line shall be known in Israel as the family of the unsandaled. Okay, that's the end of the Bible verse, but I also was thinking, I think she should be able to like slap him across the face with the sandal or something, right? (laughs) Okay, so because this made me literally laugh out loud, I had to consult my older brother Chandler, who is very educated and has lots of degrees and all these things in the Old Testament. So I asked, is it really something, like, is that shameful? Like, why is that such a big deal? Whatever. He said that definitely part of it was public shaming. Having a woman spit in your face in front of the elders was shameful. But these specific laws aren't about protecting the woman as much as perpetuating the family house of her dead husband by producing a male heir. The negligent brother is basically a guy who shows a total lack of care and respect for his brother and is fine just letting his family line die out. So for you to do that, you kind of have to be like a low life. I don't know if that's the right word, but not really caring about, you know, your family's lineage or your brother's lineage or your sister-in-law. So I don't know, kind of selfish, I guess. Anyways, this law very much applies to Judah and Tamar. Okay, getting back to Onan and Tamar. Sorry, we've been a little bit all over the place. But I thought this was interesting learning the context. The fact that Oan, on, 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 Onan, Onan. Sorry, I keep calling him different names, but this one's throwing me off. The fact that he didn't do what he needed to do to conceive a child with Tamar was really wrong. But the fact that he was playing a facade and he was pretending to do the right thing, so he's basking in the honor of helping his sister-in-law and upholding the law, but he was really just a fraud. He didn't want to say no and get spit on in front of the elders, so I guess this law's consequence was enough in this society to stop Anin from outright rejecting his sister-in-law. But I was also wondering because the child that they would have together would have Ur's name and Ur was known as being so evil. Did 
Anan not want to pass along his child with Ur's evil name? Or did he have a dislike for Tamar specifically because maybe he associated Tamar with Ur's death? I guess we'll never know, but God obviously knew his reasons and he was displeased, so he took Anan's life. So continuing the story in Genesis. Two boys down, one to go. Then Judah said to his daughter-in-law Tamar, Remain a widow in your father's house until my son Shelah grows up. For he thought, I am afraid that he may too may die like his brothers. So Tamar went and lived in her father's house. Which, okay, I don't blame Judah here. It sounds like this has been two kind of extreme situations. But basically, Tamar is getting shafted according to the Old Testament law. This family is not stepping up and doing what they're supposed to do once Tamar married into this family. So again, in a 2024 American individualistic mindset, we would probably look and be like, oh good, set Tamar free. Let her find her true love. These two men were bad to her. This family's bad to her. Let her find her man and choose who she wants to love. But really setting her free in this context is the complete opposite. So sending her back to her family without a husband made her vulnerable, made her living in limbo. She didn't know what was going to happen because she was betrothed to the other son, but was he really going to come marry her? Was he just going to get concubines or what? Because she was still under Judah's house. So she was still under the control of Judah because she was married into that family. She just had to wait on Judah to do something for her. So really, she didn't have freedom She was kind of bound to the law, but Judah was kind of shafting her and not following what he should. So she went home and kind of waited. But then this is interesting. She takes matters into her own hands, and I think it's kind of cool. So in a turn of events, Judah, the father's wife, died. And when the mourning period ended for Judah, he was traveling. So Tamar heard that her father-in-law was traveling after his mourning period of losing his wife. And in Genesis, it says, So Tamar removed her widow's garments and covered herself with a veil and wrapped herself. She had seen that Sheila had grown up and she had not been given to him as his wife. When Judah saw her, he assumed she was a prostitute, for she had covered her face. So he turned aside to her by the road and said, Hear me now, let me have relations with you, for he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. And she said, What will you give me if you have relations with me? He said, Therefore, I will send you a young goat from the flock. She then said, Will you give me a pledge until you send it? And he said, What pledge shall I give you? And Tamar said, your seal and your cord and your staff that is in your hands. So he gave them to her and he had relations with her. And Tamar was conceived by Judah. Then she got up and departed and removed her veil and put on her widow's garments. Okay, so is this story pro-prostitution? No, Leviticus 19.29 says, Do not degrade your daughters by making her a prostitute or the land will turn into prostitution and be filled with wickedness. However... I feel like Tamar always got the tainted view in this story, but Tamar wasn't going out to prostitute herself to everybody. She was going out with the intention to get what she was owed from her husband's family, an heir. Judah is the one who saw she was a prostitute and got involved, which says, I think, a little bit about his character. He definitely had no reluctancy to stop for a little afternoon delight, you know? So just again, an interesting picture into Judah. So fast forwarding the story, three months later, Judah heard that Tamar was pregnant, supposedly by prostitution. That's the rumor going around the well water. And he wanted her brought to him so he could burn her. Also, I just want to say here, I was thinking through this. Did Judah harbor some bitterness towards Tamar since both of her sons died when they were married to her? I don't know. It's not it wasn't Tamar's fault and he's the one that broke the law and cast her aside, but then he was really quick to want to burn her while she was waiting for him to do something. I'm just saying I kind of wonder if there was some bitterness there. I don't know, just a thought. So Tamar sent a word to her her father-in-law Judah saying, "I am pregnant by the man to whom these things belong." She also said, "Please examine me whose signet ring and cords and staff are these." And Judah recognized them. And he said, She is more righteous than I, since I did not give her my son Shelah. 
and he did not have relations with her again. So basically, at the big dramatic ending, he wants to burn Tamar. Tamar says, I am pregnant by whoever has, whoever's staff this was and whoever's ring this was. And he's like, oh my gosh, they were mine. And he realizes she tricked him, but she is still even more righteous than him because she followed the law and she followed the law by tricking Judah. It was really crazy. So this story closes with Judah realizing that he was wrong. And Tamar followed the law and ensured that her well-being was tended to and that she would have a place in society and be cared for. So when you look at this story with a cultural and historical lens, it doesn't sound as weird as when you just read through it in the middle of Joseph's story. And I will say, Tamar is pretty legit. Really, she's actually a righteous woman pursuing God's law, the path she has been given by God, and holds people accountable to follow the law that God gave them as well. And at the close of this chapter, Tamar gives birth to twins, Perez and Zara. And Perez continues the family line with the descendants, including King David and, of course, Jesus. And one thing I've learned doing a small dive into the Old Testament, (laughs) Jesus's descendants in the Old Testament, well, probably in the New Testament too, have some really quirky and dysfunctional stories. And I really can't wait to dive in and tell you guys more. So what can we learn from this story, my friends? I think there are many practical takeaways, but the one that sticks to me out the most is accountability. Tamar knew what was right according to the law God had given them, and she was going to make accountability happen. Yes, you can say partly from desperation. She didn't have a lot of other options. Her livelihood was at stake, but also because she knew it was the right thing to do. Secondly, this story is a reminder of God's faithfulness to his people. He promised a savior, and he was continuing his promise through using Tamar, a woman who stepped out and followed his law. She took a risk, and she followed the law. So friends, I'll end with this. What does accountability look like in your life? Have you set up yourself for success, or do you feel overwhelmed like you're floundering with life's expectations? I feel like accountability is often associated with negativity. To be accountable is a reminder that I'm not doing what I should or somebody's nagging me or that I'm failing. But on the contrary, having someone who loves you keep you accountable can bring new breath and perspective into your life. Someone who gently checks in or gives constructive criticism can bring newness and change. My dad used to say, God is found in the newness. God is in the cultivating, the growing, the changing, the maturing. Don't be afraid to ask for accountability. And don't be afraid to gently and lovingly bring accountability to others. We all need friends like that in our lives. Well, thanks for listening, friends. I hope you enjoyed today's The Unflannelgraph Story of Judah and Tamar. I hope it wasn't too all over the place. I did a little bit of this off the cuff because... Last night, we forgot to close our chicken coop, and we woke up this morning to feathers all over our yard, and it's still dark outside. So once the sun comes up, I'm going to assess how many chickens we have left and try to clean up a little bit. So my mind's a little bit all over the place, but I hope you all have fabulous Fridays and weekends. Again, thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoy this series as much as I'm going to next week. We're talking about an interesting topic that someone asked me to talk about, and I think you'll like it. I'm going to have to do some research over the weekend. Okay. Happy Friday, friends. I'll talk to you soon.